1989 to 96 is our text. Psalm 119, verse 89 to 96. This is God's inspired and inerrant word. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You you establish the earth, and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. The reading of God's word. Be seated. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we come to this portion of your holy word uh, with expectation uh, that you have spoken by your spirit in this section of Psalm 119, uh, that you have a word for us uh, in this section. We pray that by the spirit's help, we'd be able to comprehend uh, what it is that you have to say to your holy saints, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For the writers of Scripture, the world around them was a theological learning ground. The biblical writers, especially the psalmists, thought deeply about God's work of creation and His providence the Lord's sustaining of his created works. The writings are full of musings about the created world and uh, analogies drawn from creation. The 119th Psalm contains uh, the writer's musings about God's Word, what the Word is, and what the Word does in the life of a believer. In this particular section of the psalm, his musings about creation and providence and his musings about God's Word converge. And when they meet, they kiss one another to form a treatise on the sufficiency of God's Word. If the consideration of this treatise in this section of Psalm 119 does no more than to raise your appreciation to elevate your gratitude for Scripture, it will have served a great part of its purpose. We'll look at the treatise under three headings. God's Word is sufficient because of, first, its enduring character, second, its comprehensive application, third, its infinite perfection. Its enduring character its comprehensive application, and its infinite perfection. God's Word is sufficient because of, in the first place, its enduring character. Psalmist likens God's Word 
to God's creation, his work of creation. First, he says, uh, like the heavens, verse 89, God's word has an enduring quality. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. Inspired writer looked up into the heavens, looked up into the sky day after day. He saw the luminaries, he saw the sun, he saw the moon, he saw the stars. And he observed that they were always there. And as he turns to relate this to Scripture, it's as though the writer is saying that God's word that proceeds from the eternal Lord of the heavens will endure even as the heavens endure now. It's something you can depend on. It's sure. It's certain. It's unchangeable. It's fixed. But then second, like the earth, God's faithful word has an enduring quality. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth, and it stands. Even as the luminaries are fixed in their places, the earth remains fixed in its place. The earth represents stability for the psalmist. Sailors who uh, have been tossed around by the waves of the sea for extended periods of time come to uh, develop a profound appreciation for solid ground, terra firma. And when they've been out to sea for a long time and they set foot on the pier, uh, uh, they recognize uh, that things aren't moving anymore. As the earth has endured the ages and now stands, so God's word, says the psalmist, endures and now stands. Even as the earth was established by the word of his power and abides today, so from generation to generation, God's faithfulness through his word is immutable. Having likened God's word to his work of creation, he turns in verse 91 to liken it to God's uh, work of providence. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. Uh, this idea of the permanence of uh, the created world is, is carried on. In this 91st verse, the they of, of the first clause of verse 91 refers to the heavens and the earth. And the reason the heavens and the earth stand this day is that God's word upholds them according to his ordinance. According to your ordinances they stand, he, uh, he says here. The writer of the Hebrews, you'll remember, um, attributes uh, this sustenance of the created world uh, in chapter 1 and verse 3 of that letter to the Hebrews. He attributes that to Christ, saying that that. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact rep representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Why do things go on day after day? Why are the heavens, uh, why are they, uh, why, why is God's word settled in, in the heavens? Uh, why does the earth endure? Why does it stand throughout all generations? It's because of the sustaining word, the power of the word of Jesus Christ. In like manner, 
God's word breathed out of his mouth through the pens of the writers of Scripture has a stabilizing influence on the lives of his saints. God supports them. He props them up. He undergirds them by his word. God's word is unlike our word. Human beings are fickle creatures. We change our minds and our opinions as often as the wind changes, and our word changes with our minds. The worldly man has, uh, uh, is an ever-changing creature. He knows nothing of, of absolutes. He reserves the right to change his thinking and his standards with the times. And the worldly man is therefore a, a relativistic creature. Uh, what's right is determined, he reasons, uh, by the individual. He doesn't want to be tied down to a f- fixed system of moral principle, uh, principles. But God's word is unchangeable. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't rewrite his revelation to keep up with the shifting sands of culture. When God revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, he did so with his own finger written on tablets of stone to indicate the permanency of his word. And it's the absolute nature of the word of God that makes it eternally sufficient. The word of the gospel couldn't be God's power for salvation if it changed from one moment to the next. It couldn't bring peace and joy and comfort to your soul if it were subject to the very same turmoil of change to which the world is subject. You dare not think about the Bible in relativistic terms. You dare not attempt to decide which parts of it are right or wrong, which parts to revise or which to keep as they are. The last book of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 4, warns us against this. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And the last book of the Bible warns us about doing such a thing. I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. People, of course, do deny it. People do, of course, try to revise it, take away, add to it, but their efforts don't change a thing. They're futile. God's word is true, it's sure, it's fixed, it's certain, forever settled in the heavens, beyond sinful man's reach. God's word is sufficient because of its enduring character in the first place. Secondly, God's word is sufficient because of its restorative character. I think I said that a bit differently when I introduced these points in the beginning because I changed this uh, this afternoon and didn't change it in, in my uh, sermon notes here. God's word is sufficient because of its restorative character. It preserves in affliction, the psalmist says. Uh, verse 92 If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished. In my affliction. Now, the psalmist has said uh, a great deal about affliction in this 119th Psalm. In verse 67, he says that God had used his affliction to correct his errant ways and bring him back into conformity to his word. In verse 71, 
of Psalm 119, he writes that it was good for him to be afflicted in order to learn God's word. He even confesses in verse 75 that God was just in afflicting him and in doing so was faithful to discipline him by his affliction. Now he confesses in verse 92 that in those times of affliction, it was God's word that had sustained him. He had nothing else to depend on. Everything else had been stripped away by his affliction. There was nothing else to which he could cling. But the Bible was sufficient to help him. God's word was sufficient to help him, even in the most extreme circumstances. If you've got nothing else in this world, if everything else has been stripped away, even if you should be as Job and have your whole world torn out from under you, God's word, settled, fixed, certain, his promises sure, will be your help in affliction. But notice what he says. Uh, notice this carefully. Here in uh, verse 92, uh, he says God's word is his delight. And he says, if that hadn't been the case, then I would have perished in my affliction. He doesn't merely say he's well versed in God's word, that he knows God's word. That's assumed. You, you, you can't delight in something you know little to nothing about. Rather, he says that God's word has been his delight. Make God's word your delight. That's the principle here. Make God's word your delight, and it will preserve you in your afflictions. Not only does it preserve physically, it also brings spiritual recovery, the psalmist says. Verse 93, I'll never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Now, this is answer prayer. In the previous section of the psalm, verse 88, the, the psalmist said, petition the Lord. He says, he asks, revive me. According to your word. And in verse 93, he testifies that God had answered his prayer and had revived him according to his word. God uses his word to restore wayward Christians from spiritual decline. Remember, remember the way uh, that Jesus, after his resurrection, restored Peter to his apostolic office. I never fail to marvel at what Jesus does here. Remember those questions, those probing questions? They were all, it's all the same question, really. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I love you. Jesus said, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said this to him a third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, ten, my sheep. Restored his apostle spiritually. That's what God's word does. It restores us spiritually. The Lord uses his word to restore us from a multitude of spiritual maladies, from depression, from discouragement, from anxiety. Those are the big three, aren't they? Especially depression and anxiety. Anxiety. 
uh, these days. The ultimate answer to these spiritual conditions isn't in a pill. Or psychotherapy. It's in God's word. God's word has this restorative power. Because the Lord had done so for the psalmist, he hadn't forgotten God's word. Verse 93 says, I will never forget your precepts, for for by them you have Revive me. Too many Christians wind up in these conditions of a depression or a discouragement or anxiety because they've forgotten God's word. Uh, they've forgotten what, what the Lord promises about these things. To forget God's precepts is to, to depend primarily on your own resources, your own strength. Or uh, the help of others to deliver you from uh, your downcast state. But once the Lord has used his word to restore you, to bring your soul alive from a state of spiritual decline, you won't easily forget its power and its effectiveness. It preserves from affliction. It revives the soul Verses 94 and 95, it delivers from trouble. Notice in verse 95, the twofold basis upon which the writer pleads with God for his deliverance. First, it's that he belongs to God. I'm yours, he says. Save me. You can hear a, 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 a note of, perhaps a note of, of uh, intensity here. I'm yours, Lord. I belong to you. Save me, the psalmist says. Now, many people call upon uh, God to deliver them from trouble using a, a form of prayer that I call the, the hey God, if you're out there, help me prayer. The hey God, uh, hey God if you're out there prayer, help me, uh, isn't effective for several reasons, not the least of which is that it's not a prayer of faith. And it overlooks the barrier of sin. Writer of Hebrews says, remember, uh, those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And the scripture says uh, that our sins are a barrier between us And our God, and our God doesn't hear if we regard sin in our hearts. But the psalmist's prayer assumes both of these things, that he has believed in God, that God is a rewarder of those who seek him, and that he belongs to God because God has saved him from his sins. Secondly, As regards this deliverance from trouble, he says that he sought to learn and and obey God's will as it's recorded in God's word. I have sought your precepts. I'm yours. Save me. I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me. I shall diligently consider uh, your testimonies. If you're not willing to seek God in his word, in order to obey God's will, then you have no ground for asking God to deliver you from anything. Psalmist says here that the wicked are seeking to destroy him. Let's say that's the case for you. Let's say that uh, people are going to great lengths uh, to destroy you, telling lies about you, seeking to destroy your, repu- your reputation or, or to harm you in some other way, what do you do? Where do you turn? Writer says he turns to God's testimonies. He turns to God, God's word. Doesn't say that he briefly thought about the word and then went back to fretting over 
over his, uh, this condition. He says, people are out to get me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. Thinking about this, this verse this week, verse 95, uh, one of our former members who, was, who had this very thing happening to him, um, people were trying to destroy him, trying to destroy his reputation. And I remember what he said to me in the midst of all that, when he's in the thick of all that. He said, I just had to go get off by myself in a room alone and sing songs. <laughs> and I thought, this is a man who understands God's word. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. They're trying to destroy my reputation. They're telling lies about me. What should I do? I shall diligently consider your testimonies. That, dear Christians, is the sufficiency of God's word. It has the power to do so. God's word is sufficient because of its enduring character, because of its restorative character, and then thirdly, God's word is sufficient because of its infinite perfections. Verse 96, I've seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Everything in the world in which we live is imperfect. And you don't have to live very long to understand that. We buy things and they're broken right out of the box or they break soon after we begin to use them. Even the finest diamonds, the most beautiful gemstones known to man are judged to be so, not because they're perfect, but because they have fewer flaws than other diamonds. The world was not created, as we well know, with flaws. God created it good, all very good, but it became flawed when sin entered into the world and with it a curse. And that imperfection, this, uh, the imperfections uh, of sin now extend uh, to all human beings, the godliest person alive, whoever he or she is is still affected by the flaws of sin in every aspect of his or her nature. The thoughts, the affections, the will, all of them impacted by sin. Not only is everything in the world imperfect, everything in the world is limited. Natural resources are scarce, time and money are limited, man's knowledge, his skill, his power, his authority are limited. But while everything in the created world is imperfect and limited, the psalmist says that God's word has no limit and that God's word is Perfect. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but God's commandments are exceedingly broad. They're not limited in their scope and purpose. They cover all of life's circumstances in principle. They're never outdated. They're far beyond our full comprehension in this life. You can search the scriptures out in every direction and still not reach their limits. You can 
Study God's word for the rest of your days 24-7 and you'll still never plumb their depths. God's word doesn't change and it will never pass away. From the psalmist's point of view, the heavens and the earth are good gauges of the enduring character of God's word because these are certain and fixed. Uh, But it's interesting to note how Jesus compared uh, the heavens and the earth to his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, he said. But my word will never pass away. God's word is sufficient because of its enduring character, its restorative character, and its infinite uh, perfections. Psalm 119. Especially this section of Psalm 119 ought to raise your appreciation for the Word of God. It should cause your appreciation to increase exponentially. In it, God has given His people a great treasure. It's so broad, so comprehensive, and so perfect that it's sufficient for every area of faith and life. Most importantly, God has revealed the gospel of his son in his word. Psalmist is so grateful that God has revived him spiritually or kept him alive. He says, I'll never forget your word, O Lord. Can you forget that revelation of God's word that has brought you life through Jesus Christ? Can you ever forget that? I hope the answer uh, is no. No, my friends, we, we must never Forget God's word. The section of Psalm 119 ought to give you a a greater desire to serve God. Verse 91, all things are your servants. Psalmist's contemplation of uh, the world's stability, the the stability of the heavens and the the earth, which is uh, the result of God's uh, dynamic word has, has put such strength into his soul that he concludes, if everything that the Lord has brought into being serves him, so will I. It's interesting, isn't it? The whole, the whole of creation serves God. The whole of creation fulfills God's word perfectly except for his rational creation, his rational creatures, you and me. We don't serve God perfectly. We don't fulfill his commands perfectly. If everything that the Lord has brought into being serves him, the psalmist says, so will I. Isn't it remarkable how putting a a psalm to music sheds further light on its truth? Uh, Some of the psalms that we sing are, are paraphrases. Uh, They all have to be adapted somewhat to to fit meter, to be fit uh, into musical meter. And we're going to sing this this section of Psalm 119 as we conclude tonight. I want you to listen 
to how uh, the poet has, has put these verses. I would have perished in my sin had not I loved thy law divine. That law I can never forget. Nor ought we. All things are thine, and thee obey, and as servants wait thy will, and so must we. There are many resolutions made during this time of year. Maybe you've made some resolutions for the new year. That's fine and well, but there's one resolution as we think about this psalm that's especially appropriate for each one of us. Resolve that this year you will seek God diligently in His eternally sufficient word. Keep that resolution, dear Christian. And you will have gone a long way in bringing blessings to the rest of this year. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. Settle in the heavens, uh, your faithfulness to all generations, even as, you, as the, the heavens are settled and the earth is established, it's fixed. So, O oh Lord, your word stands uh, all things serve you, O Lord. We want to serve you as well. Uh, we bless you, O Lord, that you preserve us in affliction. Uh, we bless you that you uh, preserve us both physically and spiritually and that you restore us from, uh, from spiritual maladies. Uh, we pray that you'd help us not to forgive your, uh, forget your word. Uh, help us, O Lord, to diligently consider your testimonies. We thank you for your infinitely perfect word, a word that is sufficient for every aspect of faith and life. Help us, O oh Lord, to abide in that word. Make your word abide in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 15.